Thank you so much, Carol, Roger, and Chad, for providing that critical perspective. And good morning to everyone. My name is David Tovar. I'm a senior policy analyst with Gold Coast Health Plan, Ventura County's Medi-Cal Managed Care Plan. We serve about 215,000 members here in Ventura County, or about every one in five residents. It's so great to be here with you today. As we heard through this morning's program, opioid addiction impacts every community across the country. Here in Ventura County, we like to say that it affects Westlake Village to West Virginia. Here in California, we are no exception. Addressing this crisis right, uh, at a scope and magnitude that we all need to create an impactful vision right, requires everyone to take part and to take a stake in the solution. And that includes the business community. That's because businesses are a vehicle to help solve this problem. To talk about that and so much more, I'm pleased to have a great panel for us today. Uh, from guests right here in California who are deeply involved in this issue. Joining me is Dr. Loretta Dennering, Substance Use Division Chief for Ventura County Behavioral Health. Dr. Thomas Dobbs, a family physician and psychiatric behavioral health specialist at Marin Regional Medical Center, Christy Thompson, Director at Given Hour California, and Ashley Nettles, a program manager at Given Hour California. Thank you so much for joining us today, and let's dive right in. Dr. Dennering, let's begin with you. In your role as a Division Chief for Substance Use Services at Behavioral Health, you have a very unique perspective on how the opioid e epidemic has impacted our community. Help, help us set the stage and for our audience about how the state has been impacted by opioid misuse and abuse. Thank you, David, and I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, as we all know, the opioid epidemic has not slowed up and unfortunately has been compounded by the COVID-19 emergency. In California, we are no different. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing our numbers rise um, as a result of uh, increases in fentanyl use, um, as I said, uh, compounded with the COVID-19 emergency and the mental health challenges and substance use challenges that have uh, arised from having to social distance and physical distance from everyone. Um, we know that locally in our county, uh, about 100 people per year die of uh, opioid overdose. And we and are uh, finalizing our numbers for the 2020 year and are awaiting that information from the state and from local officials. Uh, but we know that we have a lot of work to do in this area, but um, thankfully we have tons of resources and, and lots of work, boots on the ground work that we are um, every single day uh, putting out for our community. So you just said you had resources and programs. Can you talk a little bit about those programs and what members of this audience uh, should be aware of? Absolutely. So I would first say that um, a, a really awesome place <coughs> to look is our local website, VenturaCountyResponse.org. We have a ton of information on all of the activities that we do here in Ventura County and all of the programs that we offer. Uh, we have our tremendous overdose prevention program, which you will hear more about shortly. Uh, but we also have practical information for individuals, families, businesses, uh, treat, treatment information for people who need to seek services, um, information on how people, loved ones, employers can recognize the signs and help folks get referred to the um, proper treatment. We also have lots of information on medication safety, safe prescribing practices, and then also um, how we in the community are working together with our county opioid task force. And our primary functions for that task force are to reduce supply, decrease demand, and save lives. Well, wow, thank you so much for that perspective. I, I know that um, the work of the ARCS work group in Ventura County has, has really made tremendous strides in combating this issue. So thank you so much for your assistance on this and, and engaging with us today. Dr. Thank Dawes, you. can we turn to you? As sure, a absolutely. family physician with a specialty in behavioral health, you're on the front lines of fighting the opioid misuse and, and addiction crisis here in America. In your practice and in working at, at Marin Regional Medical Center, what are you seeing and hearing from your patients? 
Um, I'm at Marion Medical Center up in uh, northern Santa Barbara County. Sorry, uh, I'm a faculty. That's okay. I, I'm a I'm a faculty member on the Family Medicine uh, Residency Program. And last August, during um, the beginning of COVID, we started a mental health and behavioral health clinic um, that was to tackle uh, substance abuse disorder in our community. Um, what I'm seeing is what we're seeing throughout the nation. Um, I'm seeing kids down to age 12 and all the way up to seniors that are um, using opiates, uh, probably not in the way that they should. But uh, what's a little bit of more alarming is we're seeing more and more uh, youth in their uh, maybe ages, late teens to uh, late 20s using fentanyl um, and the synthetic fentanyl, which is often what we're seeing uh, cause many of the deaths in the overdoses. Um, our uh, family medicine center is uh, essentially a medical home where we, we are uh, teaching and instructing young doctors. Uh, and my role in that is to help those uh, new doctors understand the substance abuse disorders that are in most of our communities. So when they go out in there after their training, they're more equipped to help, help help in this problem. Um, we're developing medication assisted treatment programs which combines medications with our behavioral health uh, to treat substance use disorders and prevent opiate overdose. We've also had some community programs for needle exchange and fentanyl testing strips and we're getting our uh, patients greater access to naloxone or Narcan with every prescription that they have for an opiate. Wow, thank you for that perspective. I know that I carry naloxone everywhere I go. That way, in case someone you know is is struggling with with overdose or addiction, I can be able to provide it to them. Um, and of course, COVID nineteen is complica uh, complicating treatment efforts uh, for for this disease across the board. And really, opioids in recovery is is such a difficult issue. How has the pandemic? impacted recovery in, in your community, in your area? Well, uh, I don't think we're any different than any other community. And I think um, what, what COVID has uh, taught us all is we are extremely social beings. And the more we're isolated, the more we turn to other, um, other areas that we can, or other substances that we can get our hands on. One of the things that uh, is really a barrier, and I heard it earlier in the show, is access to uh, physicians and access to appointments. Um, so uh, many offices have limited hours. They can see less patients, which creates a whole lot of barriers in getting medications and uh, treatment program. I'll also say this, um, support groups, uh, key support groups like Narcotics Anonymous are not meeting in person. So patients that are uh, in need of getting that social structure in place, they're having a real hard time connecting with other uh, other members of our society that have uh, suffered from this uh, disease. Well, you just segued into my next question. <laughs> I was going to ask you, you know, what are you hearing from patients about managing their opioid use disorder at this time? Yeah, how are you giving them advice on 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 um, maintaining their recovery? Well, uh, again, I think it's really important for them to get into a treatment program uh, that has um, all aspects uh, 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 that enhance their therapy. I think they definitely need a uh, psychiatric evaluation and probably a substance abuse evaluation. I also believe that they need social services and helping them to get to appointments or uh, work with their employers. And then lastly, lastly, I think that they need the social support of a group such as a Narcotics Anonymous or some other type of group that helps them connect with other people with their disease. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dawes. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, and now moving on to Ashley, we're, we're so grateful for having you here today because you really do bring a very personal story for discussion. Like many other families across America, you had a family member coping with opioid addiction. Can you share your story with us today? Yes, thank you, David, for having me. Um, well, this is my first time sharing my personal story, so bear with me. Um, 
I, my um, ex-husband was and is addicted to prescription medications. Uh, my personal story is really, I was one of those that had no idea about what I was dealing with at home. Um, I knew that something wasn't right. There were signs or red flags everywhere, but I had never really had addiction in my life before that. And so all I knew was something was wrong. I didn't know what to do. Um, and his addiction progressed to a sense. Um, and at the time, you know, I was a stay at home mom, kind of living the American dream. I was, um, you know, he had just got a promotion. So we were in Ventura. I got to stay home with the kids. Um, seemingly our lives seemed very perfect. Um, but what people didn't know is behind the scenes and in our home, we had a secret. And the secret was that he had an addiction that I just didn't know was an addiction. I figured that, you know, he was getting these medications from his doctor, that it had to be okay. Um, and it wasn't until he his addiction progressed and he ended up losing his job. So I had to go to work. And um, by some accident, I ended up doing this work with the overdose prevention program. I was um, I simply just answered an ad to a nonprofit organization locally that was all about alcohol prevention and education. And it wasn't until I was in that interview that she mentioned that she had just started a program with the county um, regarding, you know, overdoses and if that was something I'd be comfortable with. Of course, in my interview, I didn't let her know that, you know, there was something going on in my family about that. And so I said, of course. And, you know, first day on the job, I was over there making overdose rescue kits. I, um, by some miracle, was put in a situation where I got a crash course on exactly with what I was dealing with at home. Um, I'm so thankful for me being in the position that I was because if I hadn't, I don't know what life would look like today. Um, just simply because I had no idea what I was working, what I was dealing with at home. Well, because of what you learned um, through your, your life experience and, and it really assisted you in, in moving forward and now wearing two hats, I should say, um, working within a behavioral health department in substance use prevention and as a pro, um, project manager for Given Hour. Can you tell us about your work, uh, what you do, and, and, and how your experience has really guided your, your progression forward? Yeah, so what we do is we have an overdose prevention program in the county of Ventura. And what we do is we offer education and prevention tools along with distributing naloxone to high-risk individuals. And so we started that program. When I started, it was back in 2016, um, We had it was a very small still a pilot. We had a few sites, not a whole lot of sites, um, where we were distributing that education and overdose rescue kits. And, you know, because of what I had been through, it made it, I had such a passion that I knew that this is something that was important, that lives were worth being saved. And even though my ex-husband's addiction destroyed my family. I didn't want to see other families go through the same thing. And I knew that I was put in the position for a reason. And so we really have expanded that program exponentially. I mean, we went from a 10, maybe 10 site program to now we have over 38 distribution sites throughout the county. Um, right now we're in expansion mode still. And so we are going out to high-risk individuals that are maybe at our institution. So I know earlier in the program we talked about <laughs> I heard that we were um, having Narcan kits at institutions and at businesses to be able to respond to the overdose um, epidemic. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're expanding that program and we're offering education and training for um for businesses and for institutions and offering free rescue kits for them. Um, we're doing lots of anti-stigma um, campaigns and, you know, we're really this, the, the passion that I've had because of my personal experience really just makes it to where, you know, I'm on a mission and I am, um, we're going to expand the program and um, save lives in our county and families. 
Ashley, you mentioned how your ex-husband's job, you know, his boss played a role um, in, in engaging you, as well as you talked about the partnership you have with businesses here in Ventura County. Can you talk about the role of business and, and the role of, 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 of the, the boss in this and, and how it helped bring this to light for you and, and moving this forward? So as a part of another part of the my personal story is, like I mentioned, I had no idea what I was dealing with. Um, there were a lot of red flags, like I mentioned, but because of stigma as well, I didn't want to share. Nobody in my life knew what the struggles were. And so um, one day I had a knock on my door and that <laughs> one day really changed my entire life. Um, the knock on the door came from my ex-husband's employer. And keep in mind, we were in Ventura and his base for his business was in Bakersfield. And so his boss um, noticed some red flags as well with him. And they drove from Bakersfield to Ventura to meet with him. Um, the intention was they were going to lay him off because of some red flags. They had GPS on his truck and they were noticing that he was going places he shouldn't. And so um, they came and they talked with him and he ended up sharing with them that he um, was suffering with addiction. And so um, his boss really stepped in in a big way. And he, yeah, at this time, his business and the, the employer that he worked for didn't have policy um, regarding, you know, what to do in this situation. His boss just took it upon himself to be able to do this. So he knocked on my door, made my husband tell me everything that he was doing. And then he drove me um, and my husband to put him in a treatment the next day. Um, he was the first person that looked at me and told me, Ashley, he is not going to be able to do this on his own. He needs treatment. And if he doesn't, he's going to die. Um, and he what, he played a critical role. He drove us down there the next day. His wife watched our kids while we went down to Tarzana. Um, while we were there, we found out that his employer sponsored um, insurance did not cover substance use services. And so his boss got out his credit card and paid for his services. Um, so, I mean, his, his employer played a huge role in getting him into that treatment. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Ashley. We really appreciate it. Christy, you're the director of a nonprofit business called Give an Hour. Tell us about what it is that, that Give an Hour does and what you do. Sure. Thank you, David. And thank you, Ashley, for sharing. Um, Given Hour is a national nonprofit. We've been around since about 2005, and we really provide uh, three different services. The first one is access to mental health care. We've got about 4,500 volunteer licensed mental health clinicians throughout the country that offer pro bono mental health to those that don't have access to care. So that's one huge part of our work. The second thing that we do is we really promote mental health literacy. So teaching people about emotional wellness, the signs of emotional suffering, and how to have conversations about those topics. And then the third part of our work is about culture change. Um, and we'll speak to that uh, about our, our campaign to change direction, which really is a primary public health campaign that uh, teaches all what to look for in emotional suffering and then how to stay healthy emotionally. And why we're here today is because uh, Ashley works with us. We contract with the, the County of Ventura to help run the, um, the opioid prevention program. And so that um, our uh, mental health literacy and change direction campaign are a big part of that project. Well, thank you, Christy, for all the work that you do and, and for partnering with Ventura County Behavioral Health on this immensely important, important project. Um, you know, before we end, I, I think it's critical that we touch on stigma. We heard Dr. Adams talk about it a little bit earlier in, in the program today, and we know that shame and fear can be such a barrier to getting treatment. I'd like to ask each of you, um, to talk about, you know, how we can help individuals uh, overcome that fear of seeking treatment. Dr. Dawes, can we start with you? Uh, sure. You know, I just want to say, Ashley, your story um, is very touching. And um, we're seeing thousands of those stories throughout the country. 
Um, and I think, I think the biggest thing that has to happen is first education on, on, uh, on the problem. And that, that can come through many different ways. It can come from your family position. It can come from your workplace. It can come from your school. The second thing is that we have to create these safe spaces that were talked about in our workplaces and in our schools that people can come and uh, try to get away from the stigma that they fear. And I, I think the biggest word in this thing in the, that needs to come out of this is fear propagates things that are about the stigma. So it's great to hear about all the employers on this uh, uh, newscast that have opened up their workplaces to, to protect people uh, from retaliation or from losing their job. And I'm glad to see this throughout the country. Dr. Dennery? I would echo those remarks as well. And um, thank you again, Ashley, for sharing your story. Um, I think it absolutely starts in the home and it starts in the workplace, given that that's where we spend the majority of our time. And um, having a, a normalizing the conversation around substance use and mental health. Um, we've always talked about making sure that you take care of your physical self and do check-ins that way. And we need to do the same with substance use and mental health and make sure that we are comfortable talking to our loved ones, talking to our friends, and you know, following appropriate protocols, but also talking to our employees as we begin to notice these things. Well, thank you. Christy? I, I echo what Dr. Dennering said, that we have got to make it a safe place to talk about mental health, emotional wellness, and substance use. Um, and that's what our campaign to change direction does. It, it talks and shows people what are the signs of emotional suffering, what to look for, how to maintain your emotional wellness. And if there is a concern within yourself or a loved one or a coworker, how do you have that conversation? And substance use, you know, and mental health are so closely related. So again, I think it's about culture change. It's about breaking that stigma. Um, and that, that will go a long way, but it starts, like she said, it starts at home and it starts at work because that's, you know, that's where we're spending our time. Absolutely. It does start at home and, and at work because that's where, you know, at work, especially that's where we spend most of our day every day, even though many of us today are, are working from home. And, and lastly, I'd like to end with Ashley, especially talking about stigma and, and breaking down barriers because you had to deal with this personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I can go on and on about stigma. Stigma keeps people sick. It's the reason why people don't get the treatment that they need. It's why families, um, you know, don't seek help. I know for myself, um, gosh, addiction had such a negative stigma to where I didn't tell a soul, not even my family, my father, my mom, nobody knew about what was happening in my home because of the stigma that was attached to it. Um, you know, there's, there's one thing that I think that we can do as especially talking with small businesses or larger businesses as well is, you know, some action, action items is really education is so important. Making sure that your staff are, they have an educational tool to let them know what the opioid crisis is, that it's that it to break down that stigma is really where education comes in. Um, I, my advice for anybody, if there's anybody who has family who is dealing with this or dealing with it themselves, that the way to break down stigma and then get treatment is to not let the secrets hide. Don't let the addiction have a place to hide. Um, expose it. And don't let shame keep you in a place where you won't tell the world. I was at a place, I was sitting and making overdose rescue kits and teaching people how to use them. And I never one time took an overdose rescue kit home whenever my husband was using. And that's because of stigma. We all think that, oh, not my family, not, not in my house. Well, you have to let that go. And you have to really address the situation and not let it hide anymore. Don't give it a place to live. And so um, that's where um, I think that we can break down that stigma with sharing more of our stories. Um, the more stories that are out there, not all stories are going to be great. You know, with my story, I wish I could sit here and say, do you know what? M my ex-husband's in recovery and he's doing amazing. Um, but I can't say that today. But what I can say is that I'm in recovery. My kids are in recovery. My kids no longer live in a home where there's drug use. And so, um, you know, take action and don't 
be afraid to speak out. Well, thank you so much to Ashley, Christy, Dr. Dennering, and Dr. Dawes. This was a really impactful and important conversation. Um, and one thing that I think we can all take away from this is, is whether you're an individual or a business is, is, you know, seek information here in Ventura County, go to Ventura County uh, response.org and we can link you to other resources and also getting naloxone, right? This little item can save a life. So I'm pleased now to hand over the conversation to the chairman of the Tri-County Chamber of Commerce Alliance, Glenn Morris. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Tri-County Chamber Alliance, um, I, I, let me just start by by acknowledging that panel that we just had. Um, um, Ashley, let me let me begin with you because I think your story and more importantly, uh, your courage in in um, sharing that story uh, is amazing and um, really brings home the the personal nature of these um, impersonal conversations that we sometimes have uh, when we talk about it from a policy or a, a, a you know a more macro level. So thank you for making it human and personal. Um, and for the rest of the members of the panel. Um, you know, on behalf of the the um, twenty some odd chambers of commerce uh, across the three counties on the central coast, and the literally thousands of local small businesses that make up our organizations, um, thank you for sharing the information that you have today. Um, Ashley said the place the businesses should start is with education, um, and that's why I think we were here today is to begin to educate our employers so they in turn can educate uh, their, their workforce and the people who make up their organizations. Um, I wanna thank Carolyn Crawley, Crawley and the, uh, the US Chamber Foundation for reaching out and, um, and, and inviting our organization and our region to be part of this conversation. I'll acknowledge that uh, when the invitation first came out, um, I think my initial reaction was, this isn't COVID, so why, you know, we don't have time for it. Um, and, and yet I think, you know, with a, after just a moment of that, uh, with some further reflection, it became very obvious that uh, this is a conversation that, that can't wait, um, that, that, you know, the, the issues that people are dealing with not only have not um, been put on pause by, because of the pandemic, but as we heard from some of the presentations today, um, have either been um, accelerated and made worse, or, or at a minimum have been exposed uh, in, in more uh, obvious ways. And so um, we're grateful for the opportunity to be part of um, bringing this issue back to the forefront and helping people begin to talk about it. Uh, obviously the impacts of, of an individual, of an employee uh, dealing with these kinds of addictions and challenges um, are significant on the business, particularly if they're working for a small business. Um, but we recognize that more importantly, the, the, the impacts on individuals and families and communities um, can be devastating. And so um, we're, we really appreciate those who are on the front lines working on this issue, um, I, uh, creating the, the tools and the solutions uh, that we can bring to bear. Um, you, you know, we recognize that, that um, uh, tackling an issue of this magnitude requires effort on the part of many stakeholders. And, and that can include our public health officials, our healthcare um, system and our first responders, uh, the many community and, and human service organizations that are um, trying very hard to get out on, in front of this issue. Uh, but, but clearly it also requires families and friends and individuals to step up, acknowledge um, what's going on around them um, and, and be willing to, to get involved and make things different. And we also recognize as a, as a business organization that the employers play a role in that, in that um, process as well. And, and so we're, we're, we're impressed by the um, creative solutions that we've heard today uh, in some cases. And we're confident that many other businesses, as they hear this discussion um, and have a chance to reflect on it as it applies to their organization, uh, that they'll be able to find the solutions or, or at least the first steps 
uh, that they can take in their organization. Yeah, if we get this right, um, you know, there'll clearly be benefits from a cost perspective, um, whether that's our healthcare system uh, or insurance. Um, but more importantly, there'll be, uh, uh, in, you know, benefits to individuals from their health uh, and, and our overall society as we get um, people more productive. So I want to just finish today by, by uh, thanking the audience, those who have joined us with the uh, program today. Um, we would encourage you to spend some time with your teams um, having some maybe difficult conversations um, and then also to reach out to your peer network and to spread the word, um, point them back to their Chamber of Commerce websites, uh, as well as to the U.S. Chamber Foundation's website uh, where they can find resources and um, engage in the conversation themselves. Um, with that, we wish you all a very um, a pleasant afternoon uh, and we wish you the best of luck in um, in, in having these conversations uh, within your organizations, your families, and your social networks. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to our hosts with the U.S. Chamber uh, Foundation uh, with, again, our appreciation uh, for, for including our region and our communities uh, in, this, in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.